Welcome to you, my name's Dale and this is Dale's Addiction. Welcome back for part two of my luxury q and I think we answered the question. The first one is really long, uh, so I'm going to split them up and make it into a two-part question. So if your question hasn't been answered yet, stick around because I'm going to get to it very shortly. Lux Closet AZ, career advice for someone starting to work for themselves. Um, because this is a and a and it's just one question, I will say this. Learn to value your time. Your time is what you sell. If you don't value your time, nobody else will. Nothing is for nothing. You don't work inside an organization anymore. You work by the hour or the service or the project. Make sure that you are valuing your time. Scope work correctly. So that any additional time is rescoped and charged because nobody works for free. And I think a lot of people feel really uncertain about that when they first start their business. It's very important to understand what your time's worth and to put some strict parameters around how you spend your time. I hope that helps you. And yeah, if you are interested in seeing a video on some of my tips and tricks for starting out, um, Feel free to let me know in the comments and I will respond in kind. Mel Downs. Hi Mel. What are your thoughts on metallic handbags? That's a great question. Um, I don't have any. Uh, I have to say when I think metallics, I think unicorns and I think no. Um, just for that reason. But I think you could argue that this is a metallic bag because even though it's not in one of the colors of metals, it still glistens and sparkles like a metallic. Um, but I'm not generally drawn to metallics for that reason. I think they get overhyped. Um, yeah, I think they get overhyped. I, when it comes to block colors without texture, I'm not a huge fan. So. I love this because it has sequins and texture. If this was a flat baguette in a metallic, I don't think I'd like it as much because I just, I can't deal with like a block color that doesn't have any texture on it. It just doesn't work for me for some reason. Fiona, are there more wheels or doors in the world? <laughs> wow. Is this a guess? Um... Doors? <laughs> um, Fiona, uh, tell us about your work life. Uh, okay. What would you like to know? A day in the life? Um, so uh, a lot of my work, well, nearly all of my work is referred work. So I don't advertise. I don't code cold call. I don't market at all. Uh, the work that I do is pretty high trust. And so therefore it comes generally from people and organizations that know me and trust me. And together we work out solutions for organizations. So a typical day, like today, I got up, I did some emails, I had a video conference with a client who I'm co-designing a safety leadership program with. Then straight after that, I had a session that was kind of professional development, kind of business development with a person who creates personality profiles that I can use in my coaching business or in team development work. And then the rest of the day, um, obviously I'm doing a video now, is doing a bit of that design work from the first client and yeah, looking at my calendar, I've had to apply to be signed up as a vendor for some companies that I'm working for. Tomorrow and the next day, I'm uh, do some retained services for an organization in the space of human resources and industrial relations. So I'll do those, that work for two days. And there's a couple of big projects there in terms of enterprise agreements and bargaining, industrial strategy, um, workplace organization, those sorts of things. And then Thursday, I might be going somewhere. Fiona, again, scariest day in your life. Scariest day. I don't know. I tend to find things that are scary exciting. So 
for me, I think about the roller coaster is scary, but also exciting. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. It's a big, it's a deep question, and I don't, I don't have an answer for it in amongst all these other questions. Uh, Fiona, your spiritual beliefs. Um, I'm not a spiritual or religious person. I respect that discipline that it takes to put your faith in a god or being that has no logical explanation i suppose i was christened catholic and i'm a bad catholic um but obviously i didn't get a choice in that uh, but i don't practice any religion and in terms of spirituality i i'll leave it as saying each to their own <laughs> Uh, Fiona, again, thanks, Fiona. Uh, goals for this year, not shopping ones. Oh, my God. <laughs> you asked the tough questions, Fiona. Goals for this year. Uh, I think one goal will be to find a property that um, in a place where we might eventually retire. Um, so that's a pretty big one. Um, to avoid getting ill and burnout, to um, progress my professional career uh, and I think the whole concept of just getting to know yourself better and what's important to you is one of those goals that I constantly have. I'm not a goal setter. I don't do that. I kind of just point in a direction and then I move towards it. And then I look back and go, oh, look how far I've come. You know, um, goals aren't, it's not a way that I organize my life, if that makes sense. Artsy was the first, asks you, often talk about bags. What about SLGs? Do you have or use some? I do, but I wouldn't say that my channel is based around SLGs. I've got a drawer full of them that I swap in and out of, but I they don't draw me in like bags do. I, um, I've kind of been through the whole, ooh, isn't that beautiful, and buy it because it's affordable phase, I suppose, in building my confidence to really seek out what I like. Um, I find that swapping in and out of SLGs is more painful for me than swapping in and out of bags and I rotate my bags almost daily. So with SLGs I think it's more about function and the size so that they can go into many different bags. But yeah I think for me I very rarely buy SLGs because I buy them for a purpose um, or I buy them to grab like a little piece of a collection or a colour as opposed to the fact that I, you know, love them. Lizzie C says, uh, between the Dior slides and the Hermes Iran, which is the most comfy? Hands down the Hermes Iran. I've got a wider foot. Um, these Dior sandals are very, very rigid um, because they because they don't have the H in them like the Iran sandals do. So it takes a longer time for them to break down and they're still extraordinarily stiff. So um, yeah, I find, and if you can see here, there's already a bit of, um, just a second, there's already a bit of like pilling on the base of them. See? Um, and I'm pretty hard on the toes of my shoes, but yeah, they these are definitely less comfortable, but they look amazing. Apple Teeny 25, I really enjoy your videos. Thanks for taking the time to produce content. Thank you for watching my content. Uh, Glenda, please, is there anything from the upcoming Chanel collections you're eyeing? And this is funny because Glenda and I were talking about the fact that I do not like Chanel's new 22 bag, the garbage bag, I call it. I'm not a big fan of it at all. I've seen it online. I've seen it in person. I know that I won't have a lot of company on that position, 
but yeah um honestly chanel bags lately i just see that you can tell that they're making bags now for the people who are buying them which is baby pinks and pastel colors like every season is the same colors it's just boring Stella KP asks, what annoys you the most about luxury YouTubers and what do you love? And I wrote back with a little devil face because I thought that was a great question. It's quite funny. What annoys me the most? Um, what annoys me the most is that I think it's very hard for people to know what the person actually thinks when they try and be diplomatic about all sorts of bags. Now, whether you like it or not, if you ask me about a bag, and I will tell you what I think about it. Like earlier when I talked about the Mulberry bag, I'm just, I'm not going to buy it. I'm not interested in it. I'm not a fan of YSL bags because I prefer styles from other houses. I'll openly talk to you about what I like and what I don't like if you ask for my opinion. I'm not... I don't get a sense that there's a lot of YouTubers that are comfortable doing that because they're worried that they might lose viewers or, um, I mean, that's just my perception. I think you don't get anywhere without having your opinion. Like YouTube is about your unique individual opinion. It's not about pleasing the masses and um, your job is not to help encourage someone to buy something. You're not a salesperson. Your job is to share your experience with that thing, what you like, what you don't like, what worked for you, what didn't. So I think that's probably the most annoying thing for me is the inability to to be really frank and honest about what you like and don't like and just say it. Stop trying to please everyone. What do I love? Um, I love people that are personable, that if they don't have their own style, that they're working on finding it and they're sharing those stories with their audience. I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of us here, we love Cassie Thorpe, right? But I'm not going to buy the clothes that Cassie buys, the shoes that she buys, all the bags that she buys. But I really enjoy her content because it's her. And it doesn't matter what she buys or what collaboration she does she still makes it work into her style like you know, ever we could all talk about cassie's style skinny high-waisted jeans a turtleneck with a mock you know with a mock neck um a statement jewelry um nails pumps you know um what am i talking about like designer sneakers and a puffer jacket and a cool cross body bag or a or a tiny bag energy bag like you just know what Cassie's style is um, so I really love that I have to say another thing that I don't like about luxury youtubers is people that don't really have they just buy bags um, and and there's and it's <laughs> it, it becomes a show-and-tell um, it's content and yeah if you're in the market and you want to see someone unbox it and have a real close-up look at that bag from your favorite youtuber's perspective great that could be really helpful but for me i just find i don't watch those videos because i'm like i don't want you to take the shine off my buying experience by watching yours and then trying to emulate it myself if that makes sense i don't know hopefully it does now these questions were from my youtube community page so sheila carbonel asks uh do you have any interest in valextra or bulgari bags i have both and the construction is impeccable better than any chanel that i have by far um do i have any interest no i don't um but i've learned a lot about valextra from my wonderful friend here on youtube train girl megan she and i first connected on the valextra bag because i bought a white peekaboo and she had a white structured valextra bag this was before she had a youtube channel and i think that's how we connected because she saw my peekaboo and then we talked about valextra and those sorts of things 
I don't really like super structured bags. So that's why I wouldn't really go for Velextra. A lot of Serpenti bags are super structured. Serpenti. Bulgari bags are super structured as well. So they're not really my vibe. Also, the um, really classic look of them is not something that I kind of vibe with. However, I do like the cabochon and I think I, in my Nick Snell tag, if all my bags were locked up and I had unlimited budget to buy five bags to last a year, I did choose a Bulgari um, cabochon bag and it was the black on black or so black version because it was really edgy and puffy but with the um, serpent head was pretty cool. So I'm glad to hear that the quality is amazing. Um, they are beautiful bags. They're just not for me. They're a bit too structured. VV for me. Love your Q&As. I'm increasingly into vintage bags. Do you have many? What's your favorite? And what are your pre-loved or vintage shopping tips? Thank you. Uh, I don't have any vintage bags except I don't have it with me. I don't even think that classifies as vintage. My Louis Vuitton Neverfull GM is 10 years old. Um, or, hold on, my Takashi Murakami Alma PM. This one's from 2005, I think. I'll find, I'll find it. Hold on a minute. Yep. So this one's from 2005. So I'd say... Is that vintage? It's nearly 20 years old. Wow, she looks good for 20 years old. So yeah, I don't really buy vintage bags because I'm super fussy about condition. Um, if I'm going to put wear on a bag, I want it to be mine. The reason I purchased this one is because it's in great condition. It's got a couple of very faint watermarks, but otherwise it's immaculate. There's no bleeding or discoloration. It's a beautiful, beautiful specimen of a bag. I bought the Neverfull GM, which is 10 years old. I bought that, um, and whether you classify that as vintage or not, because I wanted a monogram Neverfull where the Vachetta was already patinaed so that I didn't have to worry about it and that it was already worn in because I knew I'd be using it for travel and it would be having a hard life. Um, so I used to think that I wanted to buy a Chanel flap from the 80s, you know, to commemorate my birth or maybe from the 90s, from when I kind of came of age, you know, 16 to 18. But I don't anymore because I don't like the look of the flat quilts. I don't like gold hardware as a rule. Um, I just, yeah. <laughs> so here I go again saying, I don't, I, I don't. <laughs> Um, do I have any tips? Look, you have to be okay with things being worn. I think that's what vintage is all about. Like it's had a life before you. It's got stories to tell. So my tips and tricks would be not to purchase vintage with a mindset that it's going to be new and sparkly. And for me, buying luxury and designer is a new sparkly special experience i don't get that from secondhand vintage pieces that's just me may tk asks how did you learn filming and editing techniques at the start of your youtube career and thanks for being wonderful and great content dale thank you very much uh how did i learn well i have imovie on my macbook and I, use, I watched a lot of i think his name's justin brown videos that were quick tips and tricks about editing, like how to do cutaways and those sorts of things. So, yeah, I think iMovie is pretty intuitive. Um, and I know a lot of people just edit on their phone as well without being on a laptop. But for me, like I've got nails and they just make things a little bit tricky when things are very small. So I do like using the laptop for editing. Love and Luck says, cute dress, love the bag. Thank you very much. No question. Um, Stephanie Lima, how can you be so wonderful? Haha, <laughs> kisses from Brazil. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, you know, it really is hard work. <laughs> um, I think that's all about perspective, but yeah, thanks very much for that compliment. 
Jane Church. Tell us all about your dogs. More dog content, lol. How old are they? When and where did you get them? Okay, well, the dogs aren't in here at the moment, so I'll pop in some pictures of the dogs. Um, so Alfie, uh, Alfie was a surprise. Alfie is a Maltese Shih Tzu and he's a big boy and a lot of people with a Maltese Shih Tzu and he has papers, he's like bona fide purebred dog. Um, a lot of people with Maltese Shih Tzus look at him and think, whoa, he's huge. Um, Alfie's kennel name wasn't Alfie. Alfie's kennel name was Brutus because <laughs> he's a big boy. Um, I should go and get him and show you because he's like he's a fair lump of a lad. Uh, and he was Brutus because he used to push everyone out of the way to eat. I didn't know Alfie was coming. I had a dog at the time called Tux, as in T-U-X, Tuxedo, because she was black and white. Um, and my husband, now husband, uh, at the time, thought he would surprise me. And these people came knocking on my door one night. He was out at a work function with two puppies in their hands. And two puppies in their hands and said um are you dale i said yeah and i said well this is for you and i'm like no they said yeah yep. your um partner i said yes and i said oh well this is for you we just picked this dog up and we bought it with us because this one's ours i'm like okay and um so alfie is an ornament uh he lays around like a doormat he's just wants love and attention he has no doggy instincts at all i could open up a fresh packet of meat in the kitchen and he would not raise an eyebrow uh there could be someone at the front door and he would not move an inch if it weren't for his sister so alfie is nine this year his sister edwina on the other hand I knew that my older dog Tux was coming to the end of her days and this sounds macabre but being a HR practitioner I knew that Alfie would fret if he didn't have a companion uh, if Tux was to pass away and so I started to look for a dog and I believe that rescued is the best breed um, and Tux was a rescue and Alfie wasn't obviously <laughs> Um, so I started to look around for small dogs. Um, it had to be a small dog because we have a small block um, and we could have three dogs for a little while. Uh, I found Edwina on a Facebook page and <laughs> and <laughs> she was my second choice from the litter. Uh, I definitely wanted a female dog. Um, and let's just say... I went to visit her and she came from a very interesting set of circumstances. Uh, she had more teeth than the people that were selling her. Um, I went to see her two weeks after she was born and I put a $100 deposit down and they were asking $350, which is very cheap, saying that she was a Maltese Shih Tzu, but she clearly wasn't. Um, I thought, that's fine, that's good. She's going to be a small dog anyway. Uh, and then they kept sending me progress photos. And to be honest, I was like, hmm, maybe they can just keep the $100 and the dog. <laughs> because she had these big eyes that were like really far apart. And like she'd got a little underbite and crooked teeth. And I just thought, oh. And these people rang me at six weeks and said, you can take her now. And I'm like, she's only six weeks old. And let's just say they had some motivations for wanting the money. And they said, if you don't come and get her now, then we're going to sell her to someone else. So I did. And I have absolutely no regrets. She is full of character. She, um, her and Alf are like this. They play along together. They wrestle. They both sleep. They're so caring towards each other. Um, yeah, she has a really big... Um, personality and I cannot believe she just turned five like I still think of her as my little baby so yeah is that enough Jane <laughs> hello all right I'll, sh I'll introduce you to Alf hello come here oh god oh he's a he's a big guy say hello to the people say hello to the people Alfie 
So he is a big dog. Like if I stand up, I'll show you. Like he's a big guy. Like a lot of Maltese are not this big. But he is a big guy. And he's beautiful. Aren't you big fella? You beautiful guy. Turn around. There you go. He doesn't like cameras. He don't like cameras too much. So he's, yeah, he's like a, like a big teddy bear. He just loves snuggling. And then, and this is little Edwina. You can tell that she doesn't look very similar to Alfie at all. She's much more rugged and um, she's turned into a beautiful little dog because you were a little bit interesting looking, weren't you? And again, she's very loving and very mischievous as well. Very sleepy all the time. But yeah, we're really lucky. They're beautiful dogs. Okay, Moomy Kiki asks, in your collection, which bag has the most and least cost per wear and was I surprised? So I'm going to have to say that the least cost per wear bag that I have in my collection would probably be this one. I use this Chanel Golden Class Wok more over the entire period I've owned it than probably any other bag that I have. It is a go-to. Um, I think I bought this bag back in 2016, perhaps. And I just use it all the time. Like, it's always a go-to travel bag. When I just run to the shops, I grab it. When I want a very small clutch, I grab it. When I go for an evening out and I want to be hands-free, I grab it. Yeah. Um, I'd have to say this one and it may surprise you but I think this one is my highest cost per wear because I've only really worn it once or twice um, yeah I think she might need to find a new home um, and not because I don't think that this is a beautiful bag I just know that when I pick it up I know why I don't end up taking it and it's just the shape I thought the 25 was a small bag but it's actually still quite big so for me anyway so yeah this would be my highest cost per wear on the basis that I've hardly worn it Shelby Bedgood aside from bags what's worth the splurge in your opinion shoes jewelry skincare etc and how can you be confident you aren't purchasing a fake when buying pre-loved I'm afraid to buy pre-loved because of super fakes yeah okay so there's a lot in this question um what's worth the splurge i would splurge on all of those things to be honest shelby shoes jewelry and skincare um if you can um i don't necessarily think because it's the most expensive it's the best but i always try and buy the best thing that i can buy for what i want to spend if that makes sense um how can you be confident you're not purchasing a fake obviously get to know your brand do a lot of research if you're buying pre-loved you should know um some of the traits of the bag whether it's about the fonts um you know the quilts and the design you want to know you know these sorts of markers um where it says the made in that it's got little authenticity tags that it's been separately authenticated um that the buyer has a really open and transparent communication sorry the seller has an open and transparent communication process i always like to buy my pre-loved bags with a full set meaning it comes with everything the box the paper the camellia the ribbon um, the receipt uh, all of those things make it really hard i know that some super fakes do do boxes and authenticity cards as well because i've seen one uh, but i think those things really help and buy from um, trusted buyers and if they don't have any references then ask them to provide some um, for you people that you can contact and talk to about their selling history narelle again she's popped up in youtube what's your most favorite and your most treasured bag in your collection well i think i've already talked about those but it's going to come down to these ones. This one's treasured. This one's my favorite. Just because I don't wear them all the time doesn't mean that they don't hold status in my collection. They are very special. Um, and yeah, I treasure and love them very much. Susan Vivian asks, what are your next big purchases for this year? I know we saw the wish list. 
Are there things you're prioritizing after the Fendi made to order? And how's the Peloton? So I'll do a separate video on the Peloton. Um, what am I looking at after the Fendi made to order? It really depends what I do with the Fendi made to order. I keep talking about the Louis Vuitton Petite Mal. Um, and it really depends what comes out. It depends on whether I go for the Fendi baguette trunk in my made to order because it's kind of similar to the Petite Mal. So it just depends. It really depends. I'm, I might be able to answer that question next week. Leslie Craven. Hi, Leslie. Are you going to watch the Oscars? Do you go to the movies? And do you like watching the red carpet event with all the different gowns and jewellery? Um, I'm not going to watch the Oscars, no. Um, I don't have the attention span to watch the Oscars award show. I'm also not going to watch the red carpet. What I will do is I will visit the Fashion Critical Facebook page and I will see the commentary on the gowns and the fashions there. Now, if you don't follow Fashion Critical, you should. I will link the page down, but it's a very satirical look at red carpets and fashion and it's just hilarious and once you subscribe you will be yearning for the next upload for the next awards night to see what fashion critical says about the gowns oh, i just think it's magic so um yeah that's what i'll be doing with regard to the oscars do i go to the movies not that much anymore um Obviously, there haven't been a lot of films released over the past couple of years. But when there's a big film, like a big action film, yeah, I go to the movies. I think the last time I went was to see House of Gucci with Connor, which we really didn't enjoy. It, we didn't need to see that at the cinema. But um, the last Daniel Craig, James Bond movie, I can't even remember what it's called now. No Time to Die. Was that it? Uh, that was great at the cinema. So, yeah. For the right film. Marta Cooley asks, how do you easily switch between the bags? I usually just stick to one bag because it's a pain to empty my bag and put all the items into another one. So I find switching between bags easy. Um, and like it's very simple. I don't carry a lot. I've got my essentials, which is somewhere to hold my cards. So a compact wallet or a card holder, my keys, my car fobs, some lipsticks and... Yeah, that's pretty much it. And a mask, that's kind of it. Um, and that's really easy to change out of. It's changing in and out of SLGs that I struggle with. If you don't follow me on Instagram, check out my Instagram page. The outfits that I put together aren't just for Instagram. It's what I'm wearing for the day. And you'll see that I change my bag most days, except for when I'm working. Sobi? Sobi? Uh, in some of your videos you play in the background Latin music. What kind of music do you like? Um, I love all sorts of music. Um, I think I pick music that suits the vibe of the video. But when I'm like, I like a lot of pop music. Um, that's what I love about Peloton is the great music playlists that accompany the workouts. Um, I love the Foo Fighters. I was really saddened. By the recent passing of Taylor Hawkins, the drummer, and that what that might mean for the band moving forward as well. Um, and selfishly, I have tickets to their concert in December, which may or may not go ahead. Uh, I'm reading Dave Grohl's memoir, The Storyteller, at the moment. And part of me thinks that he will see this as an opportunity to make another drummer's career like his career was started. So... He has a lot of personal grieving to do because he and Taylor were really good, really good friends, best mates. So um, didn't mean to get all sad there, but yeah, it's um, it's always really sad to see a public trauma like that play out. So I love all sorts of music. I have Tchaikovsky and Pavarotti. I have Kylie Minogue. I have. A lot of alternative music like Bush and Hole and Silverchair, Nirvana, Foo Fighters, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Then I have really modern stuff. I love Dua Lipa. I love Rihanna. I love Beyonce. Everything. Akana Singh asks, what are your go-to SLGs, which you use and which fit all your bags? So my six ring key holder. So I don't have the one that I'm using at the moment because it's in another room, but a six ring key holder like this, I will always, always have um, from Louis Vuitton. 
because you can hold your keys but you can also have cards stashed in behind it so that's a really helpful SLG to have and also a card holder so this is a Chanel card holder or a compact wallet which I'll show you an example of here's a compact wallet from Chanel got a slip on the back and then inside I can put cash and cards there they are my go-to SLGs. There aren't really any other SLGs that I use unless you count the Chanel Wok as an SLG when this would be one of my favorite SLGs as well. Okay, the next question is from This Is Danny O. Do you have a preferred platform to sell your luxury handbags other than YouTube or Instagram? And where do you see your YouTube channel in five years? Um, a preferred platform. I depends on what I'm selling like I would never have done a vlog sale years ago because my YouTube channel didn't have a good following but now that I have a good following um, I, I love a vlog sale um, because the last one was really successful and I definitely do that again um, for bags that I feel are more specialty bags I would use a consignment store um, highly recommend the closet by Connor if anyone's looking Lux Theory and the Purse Affair. Um, I've enjoyed working with each of those organizations um, to sell luxury handbags. People complain about the fee, but I think the fee is fair. It's work. Like it's not to have the net, you paying for the network and the platform that that person has. Um, and all the time that goes into taking photos, fielding questions. If you've ever sold a bag, you know how much pain it is and how much work it is to move it on. So using consignment is a really great way of getting that done. Where do I see my YouTube channel in five years? God. Well, I'm two years in and what am I at? 6,000 subscribers. So in five years, like who knows um i think whew, that's even scary to think about uh <laughs> i think it will be the same it'll just be growing organically um i'll be five years older that'll be weird um yeah i'd like to think that perhaps um, depending on what happens in my professional work will depend how much time I have to devote to YouTube um, but it's certainly a hobby that I find really fulfilling I love connecting with people here so I say same same but different Danny I don't have a vision for it you probably can tell by now through these Q&A's that I don't overthink things in life I just do it um, and if I'm enjoying it I'll keep doing it N walks. Uh, you have a hundred k to spend on either bags or jewelry, but not both. Which do you choose, and what would you buy? That's an easy one. I would buy jewelry uh, because I think a hundred grand on bags is a lot of bags, and I don't like. And I know a lot of you don't either, because you talk to me about it in the DMs and on the comments on my videos. I don't like watching fifty thousand dollar and a hundred thousand dollar hauls. There's no joy. In those unboxings it's just stuff it's like a spoilt kid on christmas so just like oh and there's a bag and there's a bag and there's shoes and whatever like i don't think that that would be as special as a hundred thousand dollars of jewelry um because jewelry is so you know it's not something that you just go and buy heaps of right it's not it's not trendy i mean there's a lot of trendy fine jewelry don't even get me started but jewelry what would I buy? <laughs> well, if you've been here a little while, you'll know that I love the Bulgari Serpenti range. Um, I would buy the Serpenti ring. I think it's about $30,000. Um, I would probably also buy the Serpenti bangle with the diamonds because why not? Uh, and that's around $20,000, I think. So there goes 50. I've got 50 left. I love emeralds and I've never bought them because they're very fragile and I've always thought, well, if I'm buying jewellery, I want it for every day. I don't want things to be kept for best. But if I had $100,000, I would definitely be up for buying some emerald jewellery. Uh, Canturi, one of my favourite Australian jewellery designers, does a beautiful Stella ring 
with an emerald centerpiece. It's amazing. I think I'd need to have one of those. Uh, a tiara, perhaps? <laughs> it's a great question, um, but definitely jewellery. Definitely. Min Wade. Hi, Min. Min asks, uh, how often do you treat or clean your leather bags? Uh, just when they need it, Min. Um, so the ones that I have cleaned or treated the most are this one because it gets used the most. So I like to give this one a nice condition with the Colonial um, Leather Conditioner Cream. Um, I've also done my Chanel Mini Rectangular and this one. Um, but this one, to be honest, this is probably like the best bag in terms of structure um, and quilt. Like it's just a beautiful bag. It's really, really well made. Otherwise, yeah, I don't clean or treat them. That Speedy 20 girl. This girl is a ray of sunshine. Um, and she has a YouTube channel too, which I will link below if you want to go and have a look. She says, hi, lovely. Okay, what's the most you'll pay for a bag that you love? Have you ever traveled to America? And when will you be coming to Boca Raton, Florida? Ha 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 and cheers. So... Yeah, I don't know when I'm coming to Florida, but when I do, I will definitely look you up. In terms of have I ever traveled to America? Yes. And every, all of those three times I went to New York City <laughs> because, you know, I love it. Um, the most I'll pay for a bag that I love, I suppose we'll find out after my Fendi made to order experience. Stay tuned. That will be coming up very soon. And the final question is from Winnie B, LV, Mouth of the South. No intro, no outro, just that ho. She says, did it hurt when you fell from the sky, Angel? <laughs> Winnie, you are a delight. Thanks for your fabulous question. And uh, no, my wings saved me on the way down, girlfriend. Um... Thank you all for your generous time taken to ask these questions. I've got a lot of editing to do. I'm looking at the clock here. I've got about, well, not a lot of editing because I, don't, I like to keep these nice and clean. But, you know, me getting up and getting bags and sitting back down, I'll cut those bits out. So I'm sitting at an hour 26. So maybe it might be a three-parter. We'll see. Anyway, um, hopefully you like this. I will put these out in volumes. And... If you like my channel, please give me a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. I mean, if you haven't already and you've watched all these videos, you're probably not going to, right? And uh, I usually put out videos on Wednesdays and Sundays, sometimes with extras. So I'd love to see you back again. Until then, bye. Bye.